Doug is even crazier. Nickelodeon's Doug is weird. Disney's Doug is even wackier. Um, there was an episode where Patty was staying over at his house and he thinks that for whatever reason it's some opportunity for him to get close to Patty. So the first day that she's staying over, he just acts like a weirdo. He puts on a suit and is acting formal with her and asks if she wants music to be put on and everything. Is just acting really creepy with her. Whatever. Then she goes into her bedroom and Judy wants to talk to her. He hears the two of them laughing, gets paranoid, and decides to get naked and crawls into the air ducts to try to spy on them in Judy's bedroom and then falls out of the air duct naked onto the floor, crawls out of the room, then later decides to hide in the shower to listen to Patty. So as Patty is about to get into the shower, Doug is in there wearing like a snorkel and everything ready and then runs away. Uh, th this... It keeps happening. The episode is like just moment after moment of Doug ending up mostly nude in his underwear, being creepy around Patty, until eventually she wants to leave. Uh, this was Disney's Doug. <laughs> he wasn't completely naked, to be fair. He's just in his underwear, but yeah, that was a thing that happened. Uh, this is what Doug Funny does. <laughs> I don't know who is supposed to relate to Doug Funny. Uh... And maybe Nickelodeon's Doug, maybe there was someone who could relate to him. I don't think Disney's Doug is going to have anybody relating to that. I don't think anybody feels the urge to go hide in, like, the air vents of their house to go spy on people and listen in on them. Or knowing that someone is going to get in the shower, so you, you dive into the bathtub and put on a snorkel and get ready for them to get into the shower and hope they don't see you. I don't think most people do that, but Doug Funny, he does that. That's just what he does. <laughs> uh, another Disney Doug episode is that Patty's becoming anorexic and she turns to Doug and says, Doug, do you think I, do you think I'm gaining weight? And Doug very condescendingly goes, oh yeah, fatty, you're huge. And ends up setting her off for the episode that she has such a bad problem uh, with her eating by the end of the episode that she faints uh, because she's not eating anymore and Doug was the one to pick that all off he, he he for whatever reason says that to her which is already kind of out of character I don't know why he decided to do that uh, and then he's too busy for the rest of the episode hunting for a lake monster that probably doesn't exist so as she's desperately crying out for help the whole time He's just tuning her. He's just tuning her out the whole time. <laughs> That's what Doug does. That's Doug funny. What a funny guy. Anyways, bat controversy. Uh oh. <laughs> did they get sued? Did they? Did they use one of the bat objects without uh, you know, reading up on the trademark? Oh yeah, Doug's first movie. We've talked about that one, too. Uh, it's like how the Gumby movie, in the movie itself, it's called Gumby 1, as if, like, they're just ready that there's going to be more Gumby movies. At least when you do that, when you put a 1 after it, it's kind of obvious what you're doing with that. But because it's Doug and he's so pathetic, the way that I always looked at it, and I know it's how Julian always looked at it, too. A bunch of us always just kind of saw it that way. It's not Doug's first movie, because it's like, oh, it's his first one, he's going to get a second one. It's more like, hey, it, it's my first movie. Uh, I, I'm new to this, everybody. You know, give, give, give me a chance here. It feels more like that, because it's Doug, because he's so pathetic. <laughs> he, he put that in the title himself, because he's hoping you're going to give him an easy time. Uh, but let's read about this back controversy. I am compelled to respond to uh, Chris Bynick. I can't read that. I'm sorry. I'm butchering your name. Uh, but their article entitled The Amazing Spider Games that appeared in your May issue. The article said that Batman would need almost a half dozen games to even come close to having as many as Spider-Man. I demand a recount. I don't know of every Batman game, but those I do know of, I will list using the same system of counting as Chris did for Spider-Man. Ooh, uh-oh. You better watch yourself. If you're gonna publish something, you better be ready to defend yourself. Uh, 
Game Boy, three games. Sega Genesis, four games. Super NES, three games. Sega CD, two games. Game Gear, one game with one on the way. Lynx, one game. TurboGrafx-16, one game. Japan only. Commodore 64, two games. Tiger Handhelds, two games. That's over 21 games! Not including the Batman Forever games and Batman's cameo appearances. Huh? Do the math, James. According to your best estimates, we count a total of 20 games? So where do you get over 21 from? Ooh, good point. Ooh, sassy sassy. We got a we got a smackdown going here. Which gamer is going to win? More to the point, however, is that your estimate includes Tiger handhelds, Japanese-only games, and computer games. You're right. Computer games don't count. Japanese-only games don't exist. We know that. No, I... <laughs> the only one I would count there is maybe the Tiger handhelds. Those are worthless. I don't think anybody counts those as games. <laughs> they don't even work. Uh... Chris didn't include any of these categories in his Spider-Man estimates. If he had, Spider-Man would still have come out ahead of Batman. For instance, there were indeed Tiger handheld Spider-Man games too. And there's also a Spider-Man game for the Super Famicom, uh, sorry, Super Famicom in Japan, which has not been scheduled for release in this country. Rest assured that after Justice League Task Force and the various Batman Forever games are released, the Dark Knight should be ahead of Spidey in the video game stakes by year's end. It's good to know that people like you are keeping us in check. Oh. <laughs> and we're sure the Caped Crusader appreciates your vigilant watch over his reputation in the video game industry. And then, like, under their breath, they're just going, Fucker. Piece of shit. Fucking asshole. Fucking James. The family that plays together. Dear VG, my wife and I recently rented a 3DO with John Madden Football Star Control 2. Hey, there's a good one. Uh, and Road Rash. Road Rash is pretty fun on a 3DO. Two good ones in there. Madden was disappointing. It sure is. But the other two were excellent. Hey! There you go. <laughs> they were. I'm sure they were pleasantly surprised. Probably not pleasantly, but I'm sure they were surprised. That they played Star Control 2 and went, hey, this game's pretty fun. And they played Road Rash and went, hey, this is pretty fun. I wasn't expecting these games to be fun. And then Madden was the one that they bought the system for. And then they get to go, oh, oh. <laughs> oh. Uh. Oh. Wait. Especially... The other two were excellent, especially... In surround sound. We've owned a Genesis for five years and are ready to upgrade. My question is this. Is the Saturn or PlayStation going to offer the three games mentioned above our favorite games within the next year? Or should we go ahead and buy the 3DO and start enjoying them now? The price has kept it out of reach so far. <laughs> yeah, are you guys going to recommend buying a 3DO? What are you going to do here? Um... I'm not gonna lie, there are some fun games on the 3DO. It's an interesting piece of hardware. It's not obviously worth going for, but uh, for people who maybe still own one and, you know, games are out of print and everything, it doesn't have any disc protection. You can't just burn things for it. People have even done homebrew. Uh, you can't just burn discs for the 3DO, which is pretty neat. Not a thing at the time, we weren't aware of that, but uh, that's at least a neat benefit to it as well. Uh, I kind of like the 3DO. Can't really say anything about the Jaguar. <laughs> There's a few good games on there, I guess, but I feel like I, I had more fun with the 3DO. Uh, but here's what they say. Sniff, sniff. Okay. It's always so touching to read about marriages, oh, based on a mutual addiction to video games. I thought they were, like, taking a whiff of them or something. Or like they got insecure and started like sniffing their armpits or something. Uh, to answer your question, John Madden Football will be available on both the Saturn and the PlayStation. I can't believe it, really? John, John Madden Football, that that obscure franchise, is going to be on other systems? Oh, wow. Uh, but Road Rash will not. Uh-oh. There is a Road Rash 64. Uh, it's possible that Star Control 2 could eventually be released for either system, but it wouldn't be for a while. 
and nothing is set in stone just yet. Whether or not to buy a 3DO at this stage in your lives is a question only your marriage counselor can answer. They probably did go to ask about that then. And you would like, what? What's a 3DO? Dear video games. Dear video games. <laughs> it's like it's like sending a letter to Santa Claus. You're just sending a letter to video games. Just the entire concept of video games. I'm looking for replacement joysticks to fit two of my Atari game consoles. The 2600 and the 7800. Atari no longer makes or stocks joysticks for either of these machines. Uh... Well... Yeah, that's uh, that's quite a situation they have. They're they're upset that they can't really do anything about that because things are out of production. You can't really blame Atari, Andrew. After all, almost everyone with the twenty six hundred has long since updated systems, and only about twenty seven people ever even owned the seventy eight hundred. Obsolescence should be expected in all technology oriented products. Or have you already forgotten beta format video and 8-track tapes? Yeah, take that, oldie. Oldie moldy. Dissed by Atari. Well, now you just got dissed by video games. That's what you get for sending a letter to the entire concept of video games. Maybe you'll think twice next time. Please, please also renew your subscription. Please, please don't, please don't uns unsubscribe to our magazine, please. Oh, artiste likes confidence. Dear video games, I'm a big fan of role-playing games, and I've got questions for anyone who can answer them. First, I would like a list of good RPGs for the Super NES. Ooh. I'm looking for a challenge, and so far the only game that has given me one is Final Fantasy III. Second, I've always wanted to create my own video game. What kind of equipment is used to create role-playing games? I think they use, like, actors, cameras, uh... You have to, like... Depending on where you're gonna be making it, like, uh... Time travel might have to be a factor. I wonder if they're actually going to give them information about game development, because that's the thing. These magazines, they never really wanted to go into any of that. One of them a while back, somebody had sent a letter because they sent one a month prior and then never really saw a follow-up on it, so they sent another one, but they were asking, hey, so I asked before, you, you guys said that you were going to do like an article about what it's like getting into the, the industry or how to get into the industry or what it's like making games, but you guys never did it. Are you ever going to do it? And they responded by saying like, oh, oh yeah, we, we, we got that in the works, but then they never did it. Uh... Because you've probably seen from some of these magazines how involved within the video game industry kind of varied anyhow. The information they may have could be pretty limited. Uh, it always seems like development is the area that you're not going to get really any response to. Uh, it's a mystery. We think the entire Final Fantasy series is pretty cool, but we agree with you that 3 is the best. But that's six, by the way. Uh, some other Super NES role-playing games you might want to check out are Breath of Fire, Brain Lord, Brain Lord, that's a great name. <laughs> Brain Lord. Uh, and Ogre Battle, which, yeah, Ogre Battle's pretty neat. Breath of Fire's neat, too. Uh, Breath of Fire doesn't have very good translations. There's some problems with uh, those localizations, but uh, later Breath of Fire games are pretty neat. Uh, games are programmed on bigger machines and more advanced software than you're likely to get your hands on in the next few years. But if you can handle a lot of computer science and art courses, who knows? You might get a crack at game design one day. Just take a bunch of courses and then, I don't know, I, I, you'll be a video game, I think. You might also consider designing your own paper and dice RPG like Dungeons and Dragons before considering any programming endeavors. 
with any luck, you'll have licenses knocking your door down and threatening your family and offering to make video games based on characters and a universe of your own making. Is that what that drawing is? Uh, but if, as you say, you expect people to laugh at your drawings, maybe a career as a cartoonist might be a better choice. Oh, do they send... I hope that's not what that is. I hope they didn't send that. You're, you're making fun of them. Hey. Hey. What the heck, video games? Now you're just getting mean. Beautiful poetry. Dear video games, words of advice. My writing of violence to people who are concerned on video games and kids are what they have learned. Uh, they're spelling Mortal Kombat if it already wasn't obvious by capitalizing the first letter of each of these. Red flowing blood and death is all they see. True to killer instinct, primal rage, and Mortal Kombat 3. All gamers like the attention given to detail. Like the programmers who design, it's what they will sell. <laughs> Can we teach kids the difference between wrong and right? Or is finish him going to be the end of a real fight? Mom, give them a break. They're only having fun. Better than killing each other and losing a son. All critics and censors trying to bring it to an end. Take this advice. Game violence is a new trend. Mortal reader. Whoa. Poetry. Okay, everybody snap. My Angelou's got nothing on you, Mike. <laughs> Uh, man, video games. Mortal inconsistencies. Dear video games, I loved your Mortal Kombat 3 interview because it dealt with real facts and not stupid rumors like nudalities and such nonsense. I don't think anyone would even dare put Sonya naked in a game. These are, these are the real letters now. Now we're getting the real stuff. <laughs> Here's the real gamer talk. Uh, I like the robot ninjas, but if you were to decapitate them, wouldn't you see a pool of oil instead of blood? My next issue deals with warnings on arcade games. I thought they did have oil from what I recall. Uh... Also, don't they partially have, I mean, I guess it varies, it depends on, like, who we're talking about, but Cyrax partially has his human body still intact in there, doesn't he? Uh, well, whatever. Not that I know Mortal Kombat too well. Uh, I don't know too much about the Soul Nado or uh, any other advanced MK lore uh, that changes each time they go back in time. Uh, my next issue deals with warnings on arcade games. Killer Instinct occasionally displays this message. Parental advisory, violence level strong. This game contains selected scenes of violence involving cartoon character in a fantasy setting. I have also seen similar messages on X-Men and Bloodstorm. With the home rating system in place, are angry senators trying to force the arcade industry to establish a rating system? Now... Going into this, because I was a kid who went to arcades, uh, and we actually talked about this when I was playing House of the Dead on stream. I remember it when it got put into our local arcade, it was a very big deal, because it was loud, it demanded attention, and it was trying to be scary. Unlike MK, where it's just goofy, over-the-top, uh, wackiness, with lots and lots of blood, uh... That game was actually trying to be, like, scary. Uh, trying. Keyword is trying. But if you're a little kid, yeah, it was kind of intimidating. And if that is just playing and it's audible and it's right there in front of you and you can see it, it's intimidating. Uh, not that I cared and maybe want to play it, obviously. But I can understand an arcade setting having something like that. That you at least have a warning and that's not even much... <laughs> that's not even much to really do something about it just having a screen that goes by pretty quick uh games usually offered a lot of options though to uh turn things down or even like censor attract sequences i know house of the dead has a specific version where it's even more censored that 
just blood outright is not present and they take away bodies and try to do a lot of stuff to tone down the violence even more uh there was a lot of stuff that could happen through arcade titles to try to tone themselves down a bit or just to give warnings like that in advance but uh this magazine look at the year 95 we're in the era of controversy everybody esrb is a thing now uh senators are angry and nintendo is currently in the process of trying to throw sega under when they're guilty of doing similar themselves <laughs> uh if you've played a more recent version of mk3 since you wrote this letter you've probably already seen how midway replaced the cyber ninja's red blood with brown oil Here's an inconsistency that hasn't been corrected. Look at the formatting there. Uh, when Kano finishes the forearm Shiva by pulling her skeleton out of her mouth, the skeleton only has two arms. Oh my god. You're so right. You're so right. What the heck? And I noticed it in MK3. When you do a brutality and someone explodes, 18 rib cages come out of them. And I kind of noticed that you know, Sub-Zero, he doesn't have 18 rib cages. In fact, he just has one. But for some reason, a bunch of them come out of him. And a bunch of, like, thighs and arms come out of him, too. <laughs> MK3 was really, really, really goofy uh, with just how extreme they made it. Uh, the arcade industry refused to adhere to the rating system instituted last year by the Interactive Digital Software Association, so it has tried to police itself and keep senators off its back by including its own warnings on machines such as the ones you've seen described. Uh, unfortunately, buying a home game is much different from playing one in arcades. When you see a sign like that on a coin-op game, it might as well say, hey, look at me. Uh, I mean, yeah. It did. Uh, I feel like when there was more of it, it wasn't as meaningful, but it's true. Early on, it did usually call attention. That's why so many people were doing it. I think it's why you had so many people jumping in all at once. Not just because, yes, uh, a lot of the uh, focus coming from, you know, angry senators at the time, but also just because it's a new thing and it was profitable. Hey, Mortal Kombat's doing this. Everyone else was jumping in. You had a lot of Mortal Kombat knockoffs, but you also had a lot of people trying to push harder and harder. Uh, it was a big window for that. And then, because there was so much of that, it's why it eventually all blended together and then kind of lost impact. But uh, boy, it was a shocking window when it was first happening. When that Night Trap game released, oh my god. There is nothing more shocking than Night Trap. Dear Betty, hi Betty, hi I'm Betty and I'm here to help you. I will try to answer any and all of the ink is fading away here, I can't read what you said. Uh, no matter what the subject, so absolutely anything, I'm all you. <laughs> Uh, dear Betty, what's the deal? <laughs> mm. Dear Betty, have you ever had insomnia? Oh. Real questions. Real questions, gamer answers. Ooh. Arcade sticks for 32-bit systems. Don't look too bad. I always prefer. Oh, I mean, because they're hoary. I always prefer ball top joysticks. Oh my god! Look at that! I want that. Oh my god. Look at him. Wow. <laughs> oh, I like that a lot. Oh my god. I remember Looney Tunes B-Ball. Not well, but I remember I played it. I remember I rented it a couple of times as a kid. Uh, 
the gore score industry news you can trust. Well, with a name like that. Ooh, sorry, I was yawning. Well, the big show's over, and it was kind of depressing. It was a little like asking for one present that you really wanted for Christmas, and after opening all of your gifts, discovering that the one thing that you really wanted wasn't there. Of course, I'm talking about the Ultra 64. Sure, Nintendo treated us to a new Slick Ultra logo, and a token picture of the hardware. But where were the games? Oh, Nintendo. Oh, Nintendo. Uh, they're talking about the Saturn, they're talking about the 3DO. 3DO 64-bit looks hot. It sure does. Looks hot, looks hot. Ooh, the M2. Mm-hmm. Ooh, Virtual Boy details. But really what matters the most here is the E3 news and rumors. Yes, here's the truth, and a few things we'll have to look into later. Sony may ship the PlayStation before their announced September 9th date, as they fear that Sega may take an early lead in the war. Whoa. Whoa. Yeah, I heard that Sony was really afraid of the Saturn. And at E3, E3, they they uh, they they sure <laughs> they sure were afraid when they said that their system was cheaper, and everyone broke into applause. <laughs> uh, 3DO is talking to Sega about licensing their 64-bit M2 technology so that it will plug into the Sega Saturn. Oh, that didn't go anywhere. Uh, Ultra 64 will be released December 1st in Japan after it is officially unveiled. Uh, the system will launch on April 1st in the U.S. Mm, I don't trust that. April 1st? That's goofball day. I know that day. That's the day that nothing real happens. That's the day that only jokes happen. Nice try. Uh, for people who aren't aware, though, the Sega Saturn launch in the U.S. was very, very, very heavily botched. Um, what happened was they were already kind of struggling with all of it. There was a long process of just confused decisions coming through both the U.S. and Japanese divisions of Sega. Uh, they were doing the 32X and were hoping to do a standalone 32X system, but then also the Saturn was already in development, so 32X kind of seemed pointless, and then Neptune really seemed pointless as a standalone 32X system. Uh, and then with the Saturn, they wanted to have a big, big, big surprise, and they told everybody how the Saturn was already in some stores. They had a, a big day where they revealed that uh, the Saturn is already in stores, except they didn't tell a lot of other retailers about that, and it made them angry, so they ended up just blacklisting Sega and not ever selling anything for the Saturn in their stores. KB Toys, I know, was one of them. Uh, so that happened. But what also happened was just the reveal of the Saturn. It's pretty expensive for the time. Wasn't the most promising reveal, and then Sony at E3, they went up and just set the price of their system and walked away, and everybody started cheering because, yeah, you kind of just won. <laughs> I like the Saturn is the thing, too. I love the Saturn. Um, I'm actually, like, I'm really, really into the Sega Saturn. It's a good system. We didn't get a lot of the titles over here, unfortunately. In Japan, it actually had a decent run. The U.S. had flopped on its ass really hard because it was just handled so poorly over here. Which is a shame. Like I said, there's good stuff on there. And the hardware is very confused. It's a very, very strange piece of hardware. But people who knew how to take advantage of it still got some pretty cool results out of it. 2D games on there are pretty solid. And since you could just pop a RAM cartridge into it, uh, you started getting really good arcade ports. 
Capcom fighters had really accurate ports on the Saturn, while on the PlayStation 1, long loading times, missing frames of animation, uh, you usually weren't getting a very good experience over there by comparison. E3 show quotes. We overheard a lot of strange stuff at the show, and here's a taste. In quotes, 32X is to Sega as Virtual Boy is to Nintendo. Now what is that supposed to mean? Excuse me, who said that? What? What is that supposed to mean? Are you are you trying to say something with that? <laughs> what a strange thing to hear. Why did someone say that? <laughs> Uh, whoever said that, they're a visionary. <laughs> um, I've loved video games from Pong to Zelda from Nintendo. That's a strange thing to hear. Why would somebody say that? Jim Davis uttered these words at a press conference to announce his new Garfield game from Sega. Oh. Tom Kalinske could be seen to mouth the word oops I guess because he said Nintendo Jim Davis how could you you ruined everything Jim Davis now people aren't gonna buy the Garfield and Sonic Mega Pack way to ruin everything Jim Davis way to ruin everything doesn't even know a thing about video games oh but at least Garfield Eats is a good service Hey, Sparkle. Uh, Jaguar VR really stands for Vomit Reality. Oh my god. I don't want to live in a Vomit Reality. Regular Reality is tough enough. I don't want to go to Vomit Reality. I wish Sony would turn the music up at their booth. That's a strange thing to hear. Why did I hear that? Maybe because Sony's booth wasn't loud enough. Uh, I actually saw Ed open his wallet. George Washington was blinded by the light. Okay. Uh, I'd sure like to take one of those Batgirls for a ride. Whoa. That must have been one slick nerd that said that. <laughs> As in, the grease in his hair slicked it back very far. Uh, Sega has fired the first shot in the Platform Wars, and it's only going to get more interesting from here. See you next-ish. Thank you, Chris Gore. Yeah, man, Saturn. Guys, I got a good feeling about this Saturn console. Sega... Head of the game here. They released it first. They're gonna win. It's just as simple as that. Sony, they're terrified right now. They're scared. They don't know what they're gonna do. At E3, they are just lost. I mean, they lost. Just face it, Sony. What are, what are you gonna do? Go up to the microphone and just say that your system's cheaper and walk away? You think that's gonna... They're not gonna do that, are they? They're not gonna do that, right? They're... <laughs> They're not going to do that, right? Okay, good. I guess that was just a strange thing I overheard. Strange stuff. Whoa! Video Games The Ultimate Gaming Magazine. 66% off the annual cover price. Free! Only $19.95 for 12 big issues. That's not free. Plus, we'll send you a Video Games baseball cap absolutely free. Well, that is... Man, I do want that sad-looking hat. I'm not kidding, I actually do. <laughs> Wait a second, is that a trademark? Is that a trademark there? That better not be a trademark. I don't think you actually have the trademark for video games. I don't think you guys... Oh, well, it says reserved right there. Do you guys actually own that term? You own the term video games? Ooh. 
That's actually pretty cheap for a copy. Uh, tips and tricks. If you have any tips or tricks that you haven't seen printed anywhere else, put them on a piece of paper and give it to us so then we can be the only ones with it and we won't credit you. Uh, no. If you send it to them, uh, if you're the first to tell them about a valuable new tip or trick, we'll print it and send you a cool new controller for your Super NES or Genesis, courtesy of STD Entertainment. Uh, that's all right. Uh, I don't know if I trust that company. That's okay. You, you can you can keep that. Oh boy, I know you guys have been looking for uh, pack and time cheat codes, and now we got them. Uh. Oh, they even got hint hotlines. Those were very popular. You call in. There's an automated message. It tells you you're being charged per minute. And then they try to very slowly guide you through menus uh, to make sure that you waste as much money as possible. 99 lives! Now you have 99 lives to blow. That's in the game. It, that pops up on screen when you put the code in. Oh, dino-sized codes. These are... These are pretty uh, dinosaur-sized codes. At the mission select screen, press L L L R R R L and now you have infinite continues. Oh, raptor attack! Yeah, just press L L L R R R L L R R L R L R R R L L L R R R. You now have infinite continues. Thank you. Remember all the uh, the videotapes that existed of people just reading cheat codes and it's just them saying up, down, up, down, left, 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 right, 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 B, A, B, A, B, 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 A, 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 start, start. <laughs> There's a lot of it. <laughs> I know codes aren't really a thing anymore, but uh, that was a lot of old game media is that you would just have people slowly reading cheat codes off to you. Packin' Time's pretty fun, from what I remember, but I haven't played it since I was younger. Uh, the thing is, here's a crazy, crazy, crazy thing I'm about to mention, uh, because no one's gonna know what I'm talking about with this one. But I don't know, I want to find Lost Media more. Uh, there was an old AOL game I downloaded. It was made in Click and Play, and it was also called Packin' Time. It wasn't Pack in Time, it was Pack in Time. It had an apostrophe. Uh, I cannot find a thing about it. I've never been able to find a thing about it. I swear it was only up on their FTP for like a month or something, but it looked neat. Whoever made it was an actual artist. I remember they did like a cool looking stylized CG backdrop for the opening sequence in the game. Uh, Pac-Man himself, he's not Pac-Man and I guess he's just called Pac, uh, but he was like hand drawn, hand animated. He looked okay. There was like an evil Pac-Man I remember in it who's like white and he has fangs and like crazy eyes. Uh, but yeah, it was never finished. It wasn't very good. Like the game didn't play that great or anything, but it was interesting to me just because the presentation of it for a click and play game at the time looked pretty nice. I've never, ever, ever been able to find it again, uh, which is too bad. It was actually an early game that got me interested in making stuff. Uh, but... There's a lot of old AOL FTP stuff that I'm sure just is never going to be documented or saved anywhere. It's just lost. Uh, I would love to be able to find that one again, but I can't find anything of it. Like I said, that's just... It existed. It's a thing. I've actually talked to a couple of people. People who were in, like, the click-and-play community. They're familiar with it. They do remember it. It's just after so much time has passed now that it's been, like, almost 30 years at this point. Uh... Good chance it's all lost and gone and we're just never gonna see anything of it again uh, Which is too bad. I felt horrible as a kid. I remember when I lost it I had it on a floppy disk too. I wanted to save it and if you remember floppy disks those were not very reliable <laughs> You had to reformat them a lot uh, 
they just ended up crapping out a lot. But yeah, I, I wish I had saved that one. I wish I still had it. I wish I still had a lot of the stuff I made when I was younger. Uh, but lots of cheat codes here. If you guys need cheat codes, uh, here's a bunch of cheat codes. Do you like cheat codes? They got them. They even got the boss code. Oh boy, Kasumi Ninja Death Moves! Thank you, it's my favorite fighting game. Only the best. No, 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 no. That's the character I need to know about. Uh, that's when he headbutts your head off. And I, I guess he throws you. Now we got some Virtua Fighter. These are very good portraits. I always appreciated how the Virtua Fighter models looked. And I saw it a while back. They sell figures of the Virtua Fighter characters from like Virtua Fighter 1 that they made toys that look exactly like the original models from the game. That's really cool. Those would be neat to own. Low poly figures of characters like that should be a thing. There should be more like that. If Nintendo made like a little model kit of Mario 64 Mario or something, that'd be neat to have. It'd be neat to have more things like that. Little posable low poly characters from old games. Look at all these moves. Uh, hmm, what will, uh, how am I supposed to be reading this one? Oh, here, let's read this in order. Hmm, outlawed in the pro, sure, but, hmm, in Collegeville, the glass comes out. Hmm, when you, hmm, throw down, hmm, what will, think on the run 101, Call plays on the fly with over 50 offensive sets, 14 defensive sets, direct from Professor K's textbook. Cinderella, be wearing to the... Big Dance. This guy's pointing. Hey, you see that? That's the Big Dance! It's up there! This year? Hey, th this year? On the back's better. Ooh, magic moves. I need those magic moves for Fatal Fury 3. There we go. There we go, that's the one. Easy stuff. <laughs> Easy stuff. Ooh, subscribe and save the tips and tricks. Oh, I I should get some tips and tricks. Those would be fun to read. Ooh, MK3. There is no knowledge that is not power. Remember they showed that that uh that text on the title screen. Um I don't remember that though. I don't remember the giant the giant speech balloon. Don't remember that. You might have added that yourself. Although I do like your gradient. You guys are very good with the gradients. You have been chosen to repre Welcome to the second installment of Sent Earth in Mortal Kombat. With video games continuing Mortal Kombat 3. Be warned, although yourself in the ways of combat, we've compiled a list of of souls are protected against utilities as well as the brutal excess of what sure Shao Kahn's evil. Your lives are to be the hottest fighting game of 1995. Wow, really? Shang Tsung, Sindel, look at these new characters. This game's gonna be so fucking cool. It's gonna be so fucking cool. 
I bet they're gonna bleed, and I bet they're gonna swear. <laughs> it's gonna be so cool. And clearly, you can't get any better than this. Might be the best character the series has ever had. Can't do any better than Striker. This is this is the peak. Mortal Kombat, you did it. You made the perfect character. Uh, my favorite part of Striker is his idle animation where he's rubbing his belly constantly. Uh, if you want to go look that up, I'm not making that up. It's, it's, it's what he does. Whoa, and there's Cyrax, Cyrax and Sector. Except that's not their names. It, it was supposed to be ketchup and mustard. Oh, misleading. Where's the consistency? Oh, the mercy system. People know about the mercy system. Oh, the hidden game. I remember that Mortal Kombat 3 had two hidden games in it. They did have Pong, uh, and it was entertaining how they did it for Pong. They have a screen like that that pops up and it gives you a warning. It's very dramatic, telling you that you have to face a challenger from your past, and then you just play Pong. Uh, but they also had one that was kind of like... Uh, like Galaga styled game kinda it did not play well at all it was very messy uh, but they also had that in there as a game you could play too and you know everybody remembers the combat codes right because they were using these for their marketing which actually was a pretty smart idea uh, these combat codes most of them don't even really matter they were for dumb little things to modify matches things like oh the timer has been turned invisible it was them basically doing like just debug, uh, sorry, debug functionality, uh, de debug, debug functionality with a lot of it. It's just little testing things they had. Some of them could be things like, oh, the one hit knockouts. Uh, combat codes were fun. They were neat, totally unnecessary. And while they're neat, not really even a thing people would use too often. The ultimate combat code was used because that would unlock a character, but, uh, the normal combat, uh, combat codes were just kind of fun, just kind of a neat thing they threw in. And because there were so many of them, that was what they did with the game. They marketed the uh, the game with a lot of this stuff. Commercials, uh, magazine ads, they had that videotape with the really awkward uh, CG animation mixed with the 2D animation. Uh, I can't, I, I forgot about that. The AV cable to our VCR broke. Like, it's stuck in the VCR. We have to see if we can get it out later. Because we did find our Mortal Kombat tape. We were watching it a while back. Um, that would be a fun one to watch. Uh, what is it called? I'm trying to remember. Does anyone remember the name of that tape? It's like only a half hour long. It was kind of a promo to go with the movie. Uh, and it does have Mortal Kombat 3 combat codes attached to it, except... From what I remember, one of the combat codes doesn't even do anything. Like, it's just not even a proper code. Uh, oops. Which, that's easy for me to believe. I could understand if during development, as they were putting those out there, they accidentally used, like, codes that they stopped using, or they used symbols that they didn't end up using in the game. Uh, but magazine ads had these. They would always have these little symbols, and that's what they represented. It's a pretty cool idea. Uh, you have to use the buttons on both players' sides to input them. The journey begins. Thank you. That's the one. Uh, if no one's seen it before, go check it out. Uh, it's hard to find, I think, because I think Warner Brothers actually took down a lot of it, even though it's like, hey where are people supposed to watch it then? Because you're not listing it anywhere. Are you just expecting them to have to go find like an eBay auction and buy an old videotape or something? 
Uh, I do have the video, at least. We do have it here. Uh, it's very goofy. It's very entertaining. And not just because the awkward CG fighting is funny. The 2D animation is incredibly awkward. And they layered it on 3D pre-rendered backdrops. And the end of the movie, that's the highlight, I would say. There's already a lot of goofy stuff mixed between it. Um, one of my favorite shots in it is that they have a group of non-Mortal Kombat characters. They just show a bunch of random people that are there for Mortal Kombat that don't exist in the games. Uh, a lot of them just look like, you know, typical martial artists. But then one guy is a guy who just, he's like clenching a fist. He's just standing still, and he's a guy wearing, like, a baseball cap and glasses, and he just looks like a normal guy. But but he's there, too. He's a warrior. He's, he's going to be fighting. He'll be in the next game. Uh, but really, the highlight of the movie is there's a scene at the end. It is endless. Uh, they repeat the same animation probably for five minutes that a bunch of... What are they called? The Baraka's race, Tar, 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 Tar or something. I don't remember. <laughs> I played this when I was like eight. Uh, but they keep coming in. There's just footage of them running into the room, and then only two or three clips of Liu Kang punching them, or Johnny Cage punching them or Sonya punching them and like I said it repeats this for five minutes it's just recycled footage over and over again of them just fighting the same characters repeatedly and then more of them run into the room then they repeat the footage of them beating them up again then more of them run into the room then more repeated footage of them beating them up again then more of them run into the room I'm not exaggerating any of this it goes for like five minutes at one point they get bored not really they get bored they want to they want to fool you that there's new animation so what they do is they do fake slow-mo and since it's animation you can't really do slow motion unless you're going to add more frames on which they didn't do so they did this thing where it awkwardly just leaves after images from previous frames everything looks muddied it's like you're in a weird fever dream there's this one clip they keep using. Everyone else is fighting. There's clips of everyone like punching and kicking. Johnny Cage has this clip where he's just walking backwards. And they use it repeatedly. At one point they use it that he starts walking backwards. He does this like power strut backwards. And then they flip the footage and he does it the other way. And as it's in slow motion and all these like clips are being blurred together, mixed in there is Johnny Cage walking backwards in slow motion. It, it's something to behold. You need to watch it. Uh, I recommend it highly. Um, probably the best Mortal Kombat media. And that's saying something because they're known for top-notch quality. That series, like I, I'm pretty sure the majority of the games were all reviewed really well. Um... Mortal Kombat Advanced, classic. Um, man, the Game Boy ports were great. Uh, MK4, ooh, it was a treasure. MK versus DC, uh, they had so many, so many incredible titles. What are we talking about? Special E3 previews. Oh, oh, oh yeah, Donkey Kong Country 2. Hey, there's a game. Pretty good game. I wonder if they're going to show any of the unused stuff, because there are a couple of, like, Unused... No, they didn't. Well, here's Killer Instinct. Killer Instinct's pretty cool. Killer Instinct was going to be ported to the N64. That was the point. Uh, Killer Instinct was in the arcade first. And they wanted to show off Killer Instinct's cabinet. Stereo speakers. Really loud. Uh, because the music was great. Really good soundtrack. If you never heard it, uh, look up Killer Cuts. It's worth it. They even made a vinyl of it. Which we have. Uh, I forget where we found it. It was like years back. Uh, we found it at, I think it was a barcade. They just had it for sale. Uh, it was very cheap and we got it. But yeah, Killer Cuts is great. It's fantastic. And game looked really good for the time. Even now, there's some neat stuff that they did with it. Uh, the renders don't look so hot now, but still, it was a pretty neat title. It was pretty impressive for the time. And the big deal about it was it was supposed to be a preview for the Ultra 64. It was going to show you the power of what the Ultra 64 could do. Uh, it never came to the Ultra 64. Oops. 
Uh, also, it had an internal hard drive, so it could store the massive, like, almost 200 megabyte ROM file in there because there's a lot of audio. Uh, there's a lot of video files. N64, you probably knew that about it. 2D wasn't so great at doing it. 2D texture storage, incredibly limited. That's why a lot of games didn't ever, ever push for cinematics or any of that because that takes up space. Audio takes up space. Uh, Killer Instinct 2 got ported to the N64, but they had to do a lot to downgrade it just so it could work on the system proper. Had to strip out a lot of stuff. So if Killer Instinct 1 was going to be ported to the N64, same thing would have happened to it. But that's what ended up happening was it didn't come to the N64. People wanted it so badly that they ported it to the Super Nintendo instead. Was that a good decision? Uh, I think at the time it was. It seems like a lot of people bought it. Black cartridge, it looked cool. And it's not a bad port, it's just... I mean, it was supposed to show off what the N64 could do. It's kind of weird not to release it on the system it was advertising. So, uh, the preview in the arcade where it says coming soon to your home on Nintendo's Ultra 64, yeah, oops, uh, kind of lied a little bit, oops, oopsies, not really a lie, just, uh, things changed, we ended up with a Super Nintendo port, there's also a Game Boy port, I never played it, uh, but that also exists. Oh boy, special E3 previews. We got uh, a plane, plain old planes. Oh, and then we also got Spot Goes to Hollywood, the uh, the much anticipated sequel to Cool Spot, which I don't remember. Spot Goes to Hollywood at all. Uh, I remember people weren't obviously as into it. Um, people were surprised that this was the sequel. Um, because Cool Spot actually did decently as a game. And it's not bad. It's nothing too special. But it's a fun enough little platformer. If you're new to video games, if you're like a beginner and you're trying to get into them, Cool Spot will probably give you a decent time. If you just want kind of a laid-back little platformer, that's fun enough. Uh, I don't remember this one, though. I like that shark, I guess. Uh, this isometric perspective is pretty weird. Hey, it's Earthworm Jim 2! Hey, and that's a bunch of stuff that I don't remember being in this game. I don't remember this looking this way exactly. Uh, I re remember this area looking a little bit different too. Uh, at least Puppy Love looks kind of the same. This I don't remember. Yeah, I don't really remember. I remember inflating Jim's head. I don't really remember that. I did play it pretty recently too, so... Uh, but that's not a surprise. The game did change a lot during development. There's old concept art you can find for it. One of the concepts they were throwing around, and it's probably why the game has stuff like electric chairs or like coffins that have spikes inside of them and everything. I think they have objects like that in Earthworm Jim too because there's original uh, an original illustration of Jim uh, for the game. It was a concept that health items would actually hurt Jim and things that should hurt Jim, like spikes, will actually heal him. That was an idea they were going to go with for it. Then they didn't end up doing it. Makes enough sense why you wouldn't. It's it's zany, sure, but it's just kind of confusing and misleading and I'm sure it made the game way too easy doing that anyhow. Yeah, the 3D skull's weird, isn't it? Like I said, I don't remember that at all. I know this backdrop. This backdrop is the stage where he inflates his head. 
But I don't remember that skull, unless maybe there's something in the game that I just never stumbled upon before or something. But right there it says Circus of the Scars and says, uh, I mean, it's describing like a whole circus scenario here. I don't remember a circus level. I just remember inflating Jim's head and that was the backdrop for it. The skull wasn't used, but all the other stuff was. Oh, and that has the skull coaster in it. I'd like to see that. That's cool if there's footage of it. Because, yeah, I'd be interested. Prototype stuff is always really interesting, and Earthworm Jim has always had that as a as a thing, that things just change a lot during development. Earthworm Jim 1 had a bit of it. Uh, 2 it seems like it has a bit of it as well. Not to mention, every release of 2 is very different. The first level will look completely different depending on which version you're playing. But also, Earthworm Jim 3D, it started off as a completely different game and then turned into the one that ended up as. Oh boy, Casper for the 3DO! If this felt like it wasn't a very good PS1 game, don't worry. I guess it's because it's also a 3DO game. What's Casper searching for? His pants, perhaps? That's gross. Casper certainly looks impressive. Uh, if you say so. <laughs> oh, Descent! Ooh, and Wipeout. Uh, I don't remember Destruction Derby being anything to really write home about. But oh my god, it's Tekken! The very original Tekken! <laughs> Look at these portraits! Now keep in mind, if your game was non 3D at this point, uh, well, I guess a year after this really, but around like 96, 97, if your game was non 3D anymore, if you were still a 2D game, people would tell you that you were just worse your game looked worse just naturally and uh so you know you guys have probably seen snk fighting games before you've probably seen fatal fury you've probably seen like king of fighters maybe you've seen you know how nice snk sprite work tends to be but despite all of that usually when they were having their releases at this time they were starting to get a lot of flack for their visuals despite how nice they are for 2d visuals in an arcade game they look great uh, getting a lot of flack just for not being in 3D, and you know, when you see stuff like this, it really does just make a lot of sense. I think 3D is just better than 2D naturally. It just looks better. We, we've finally achieved realism in video games. <laughs> oh, we got more. Wow. Oh! <laughs> oh, that's a good one. This is, this is a really good one. <laughs> Secret characters were always really exciting though in games. But you know what's even cooler than a secret character? An unused character that's pretty much 100% done and that you could just activate with a code or like by data mining. Sonic the Fighters had a bunch of breakthroughs with that, which was really cool. There's like four or five unused characters in that game. And I think the Xbox Live Arcade re-release of it, there's a way to activate them in it. At least from what I remember, uh, I never got it. But I remember they showed in screenshots that they were playing as some of those characters, which is pretty neat. 
that uh, honey is actually playable. That's pretty cool. Hey, Cyber Sled! I was actually I was talking to Zone earlier. We were, we were talking about games. Cyber Sled was one of the ones I was thinking about. I remember my arcade got Cyber Sled, and I liked it a lot. Cyber Sled was pretty neat. It's just because the cabinet was cool. <laughs> Big cabinets with weird control schemes uh, just felt cool. I really liked Cyber Sled, I remember. I thought it was a neat game. Because we were talking about a lot of Sega Model 1 and Model 2 stuff. Obviously, Cyber Sled's not Sega, but uh, I was trying to think of it. There was one I always used to see in arcades a lot, and I was just a sucker for it at the time because, oh my god, it's a 3D arcade game. That means it's amazing. Uh, it was really common for a while. The cabinet for it was like a little pod that you sat in. It was like a fake futuristic like space hovercraft vehicle. And you would drive through tunnels where you could like ride on the walls of the tunnels and everything. And I forget what it was called. I saw it a lot. It was right it had like a glittery like sparkly paint on it. Like a, a sparkly finish on it. it. Looked nice. And it was fun, I remember. I just don't remember the name of it. I feel silly for forgetting because like I said, it was a common machine. I don't remember what that one was called, but I liked it because it was just an early 3D arcade game. Then there was a charm. I don't know. There's something very charming about super early 3D arcade games. They always tried to do a lot with presentation just because they couldn't texture a lot on there. There's still a lot of limitations that they're trying to meet up with. But they would still try to do the best that they could. Stun Runner, that's the one. Thank you. I was thinking in my head, like, was it something with Runner in the name? There you go, Stun Runner. I used to see that in arcades all the time. I don't know why it was so common. Probably because it was just neat, but I liked that one. I remember having a lot of fun playing that one. Oh my god, the ooze! Yuck, that's it. Wanna know about this game? That's it, yuck. No, the ooze is cool. It's a, it's a really... It was a uh, Sega Technical Institute, which was like a Western division. People who moved on to work on Sonic Extreme, from what I remember, they worked on Comic Zone as well, uh, which you can kind of tell with the Ooze, the soundtrack is similar. Uh, Ooze is fun. It's actually a pretty fun game. Uh, you play as Ooze. That skull head in the middle, that's you. That's what you move around as. Uh, but you leave a trail, you have like... <coughs> Ooh, ooh. One sec, let me drink some water here. <coughs> oh, oh. You leave like... Uh, you have to navigate around obstacles and make sure you don't lose too much of your like actual slime body. And you can attack things and pull them into you and then you get bigger. Uh, it's a pretty neat game, like I said. It's pretty fun. You never played it before. It's worth checking out, I think. It's not, like, amazing or anything, but it's fun. Uh, I've never heard of this one. But, you know what? This guy... <laughs> this guy's really selling me on it. Oh boy, it's Ah Real Monsters! For the Super Nintendo. I don't remember a lot about this game. What I do remember was going to Nickelodeon Studios when I was younger, and they did have a bunch of Super Nintendos hooked up with it. Uh, there was also a Rocco's Modern Life game. I don't know if people played that one. It wasn't the best. Uh, you would hope it would just be a platformer where you play as Rocco or something, and it kind of is, except not really. Um, it's... Did anyone ever play the Baby's Day Out game? It's that. Uh, Spunky is on the loose, and you have to protect him from obstacles, and he's constantly walking on his own. That's how that game plays. 
I remember it wasn't that great. I wanted to like it a lot. I remember the most fun I had with it was there's a gigantic Nickelodeon dog bone logo at the beginning of the game. And it's a Mode 7 visual, and you can rotate it and zoom in and out with it. I remember that was the most fun I had with that game when I rented it as a kid. <laughs> it wasn't the actual gameplay. I just like I, I liked rotating an image, I guess. <laughs> I remember I had fun with uh, Mario 64's facelift, too. I remember spending like just a half hour pulling on Mario's face and giggling and being entertained by that. Oh my god, it's Ivan Ooze! <laughs> okay, this is the this is the movie game. Because I was I was gonna say the movie game is okay. It's not great. Power Rangers the movie. It's okay. It's not a bad game. When I say it's not great, that doesn't mean like oh, so it's bad. No, like it is an okay game. Looks okay visually. Uh, really good soundtrack. The gameplay isn't too much though. It's pretty basic. Uh, I remember it gets pretty unfair by the end of the game, too. What's neat about it is it's two-player. The first Power Rangers game on the Super Nintendo, not too bad. It's also a pretty decent game. Really good music in that one. Uh, from Street Fighter 2. Uh, but that one was single-player. They also did a Power Rangers fighting game on the Super Nintendo, which legitimately, I'm not kidding here, not a bad game. Actually a pretty decent 2D fighting game. I think it's based on a Gundam fighting game that came out for Super Famicom, which that game is pretty cool too. Uh, but yeah, it plays decent. Uh, weird roster of characters because they had to throw in some monsters, just random grab bag picks. Uh, but not a bad roster. And that's what I was thinking of because I saw Ivan Ooze down here. Ivan Ooze is one of the most broken boss characters I can think of. Uh, in that game, he's not bad because the AI doesn't take advantage of him, but he has a move where he can just make himself invincible. And by the way, he can fly. So, um, yeah. And when I say he can make himself invincible, I don't mean to think of like, oh, it's like temporary, but then, you know, it's like, uh... It's like Dragon Install with Soul, like he has to recover afterwards. No, that's not what I mean. He's just invincible. Yeah, he can just keep doing it. Obviously, but yeah, uh, what a character. Oh boy, it's Mega Man 7. Oh, oh, oh. You know, when I was reading the cover and they said they had awesome reviews and I saw Mega Man 7, I thought to myself, oh, so they're gonna, they're gonna like that game. Um, well, Betty likes it at least. Uh, Chris B says a bit of a step down from X2. Uh... like X2 very much, but to me, the reason that people weren't as into X2, it just seemed like it was a matter of the soundtrack taking a hit, and it didn't offer polished visuals like X3. I actually like X2 a decent amount. I can kind of understand that feeling, because X2 also does provide more of a challenge than X1. X1's a great game, but it's pretty easy. X2 starts you with a dash, so levels are allowed to be designed around you having the dash. X1 didn't do that for a lot of its stage design. The end of the game stuff it has to, because... Like 7, it's not like great or anything, it's not one of the best Mega Man games, but it's a pretty decent one, like it's fun enough. Uh, I like the sound font they used for it. There's some good music in there. My only issue is just that it's a little bit cramped on screen. Mega Man's very big. They wanted to show off. They made Sprite large, but because of that, they actually don't push levels as hard as they did with the NES games. Uh, things are a lot more focused in Mega Man 7. But I liked it. I thought it was a fun game. I rented it a lot as a kid. 
This guy gave Oh. Um. Hmm. Well, uh. You know, the playability. I, I guess you're just gonna want to play Mega Man X2 instead. Uh, even if you. What if you prefer the original style of Mega Man, though? Sound music? More of that kooky, good Japanese music. What does that even mean? <laughs> By the way, that is a statement right there. Don't worry. Prepare for a lot of that. That's old video game magazines. That article I posted a while back, the person sending the very angry letter about, hey, stop printing Pokemon covers on your magazine. It's making me look like a Pokemon fan, and now girls aren't going to date me because they think I like Pokemon. And then the guy starts complaining about weird Japanese stuff. That happened a lot. It was very commonplace. And 2000s, I would say, started kicking off the mentality of just get... get Two thousand ten. Very big window of just hey. Uh, so we're trying to prioritize Western games now. If you're not from the West, then we're not going to really prioritize your games. We're not going to give you a lot of focus, or we're going to treat it like you did something wrong, even though you did probably didn't do anything wrong. That happened a lot. Uh, was it irritating? Oh, absolutely. It was very irritating. It was annoying having people being pretty dishonest about that kind of thing, too, that it's like, oh, no, no, no. It was frustrating. Uh, but we kind of came around on that. We kind of came out of that. Uh, a lot of these mentalities, obviously, we came out of when it comes to gaming media. Um, but yeah, there was a weird mentality around that at the time. And Pokemon was one of the loudest places for it. Pokemon was a very, very loud place for people to shout about how weird Japan was, or people getting really mad about a Japanese property catching on so hard. Uh, remember, anime was still considered to be weird uh, when it was you know, first taking off. That really wacky dub. But still, it was getting people's attention. And that got a lot of weird response to it. Well, uh oh. Um. So, Phantom right here. Sound. Sound of Music gets a five. And they said, I didn't even notice if there was any. Uh, Sound of Music gets a six. They called it good music, but I guess when they made that statement, they actually didn't they didn't mean it, because that's only one point over the game. I might be the only one that thinks what he said was, was racist. What, that, that review thing? No, it, I, that's what I'm talking about. No, I, there's, an, like I was saying, there was a mentality. There was absolutely a mentality at the time. It was really frustrating for that. Because Japanese titles, there were so many good games being made. And it's where a lot of industry was coming over from. You can thank Nintendo for even rebooting the industry over here in the West. The NES, yeah, they kind of had to do a backdoor thing.
that it was just such a common dismissal that you would just say something like that and write it off. Uh, but we'll see more of it, don't worry. If you think that's the first time that's going to pop up in a magazine, no. There's going to be worse. There's going to be worse. <laughs> we have barely scratched the surface, don't worry. But yeah, if anyone in the chat is feeling like, huh, that's kind of crummy to say. That, that, them up if you look up like the earliest of video game reviews online like video reviews 2006 2007 2008 you'd still get that you'd still have people going wtf japan you still had a lot of that happening it took a long time for people to come around on that but they like i said they did eventually and thank god because it was annoying it was very frustrating having it be a thing of Hey, I know we report on video games, but actually we're only going to report on like 10% of them because everything else, oh, it's just cartoony bullshit or like weird stuff from other places. Or is... That's a real fighting <laughs> fighting game, according to these reviews. Take that, Mega Man 7. This is the real deal. <laughs> oh, they don't like the Genesis one as much, though. I remember Skeleton Crew. Uh, I don't remember if it was a very good game or not, but I remember just being charmed by how Guiltiest Pleasure? which was Animal Crossing. Uh, they had a, 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 like, they had an area that Animal Crossing I thought was even going to win. They had like most innovative game or something that it was at least nominated, but they passed over it. And that was the one that it won was Guilty as Pleasure. The idea of like, what, am I supposed to feel shame for playing Animal Crossing? Yeah, cause it's so gosh darn cute. It was a very, very common complaint. If a game was too cute, mm -mm, you're out of here. I need my blood and guts, goddammit. This is 1995. I think it's a nine. Take that, Mega Man 7. No one's gonna remember you. <laughs> They're all gonna remember... 32X Classic, Shadow Squadron. Maybe it's fun. I never played it, to be fair. 32X games have a charm to them, though. Uh, but it's... Well... One of the most playable games I've ever seen. Uh, if you if you say so, I guess. I, I haven't heard much about this game, but... Okay, this is a 10... Pretty big deal when it came out. It has actual, like, proper cutscenes and everything, too. Uh, I haven't played it since I was younger, but I remember liking it. Super Burnout. A horribly dated racing game. Oh, okay, sorry. Uh. Oh, wait. 
No, this is Game Gear. Because I was going to say, I remember playing the Super Nintendo game. Uh, I never played that one. Donkey Kong Land is as much fun as... thing though it's donkey kong land 3 right that the japanese release actually have like a game boy color mode for it there also was a game boy color donkey kong country they did at like the very end of the system's lifespan wow fatal fury 3 are you guys gonna be nice to it or not well they, he gave it a 9. Uh, Chris G gives it a 7, though, because, like I said, after 3D games like Virtua Fighter, this sprite... Uh, and Jeff says, I personally hate this series. That's okay, Jeff. Personally, I'm not a big fan of your end either. That's not fair. I don't, I haven't read enough of Jeff's reviews. Maybe, maybe, maybe good thoughts and opinions will be coming through soon. Maybe. Oh, at least they gave it an eight. Even though it sounds like, you know, two of them fucking hated this game. At least they gave it an eight. Uh, yeah, geez, SNK, get 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 your get your act together. Jungle Strike's got you beat. It's a better looking game. They said so, and they have a very in depth uh, discussion. They just said excellent graphics, great explosions. They'll sit with it for hours. Well, okay then. Oh, I remember Quarantine. Oh, they gave it a six. Uh... The attack! Oh my god! Watch out for that dragon! Ah! Hey, don't criticize the fact that they use colors with their text that don't blend into these backgrounds and it's a nightmare to look at these pages. If I zoomed out right now, are you telling me you can't read any of this text? If I zoomed out like this, you can't tell what you're looking at? It's fluffy. It's so darn cute. They gave the, the audio a five. Now, the other game, they said they weren't even sure if it had audio, and they gave it a five. So, uh, Earthbound, even if you don't like it as a game, would you all agree? Would you say that Earthbound is comparable to a game that doesn't have audio? I think that's pretty reasonable. I think that's fair. 
Oh no, apparently cuteness is now in, and I'm not happy. <laughs> That's how the review starts. That's the first. over there too supposedly uh it tells the story of a young boy's fight to save the world from the terrible space monsters who have caused people and animals alike to develop nasty dispositions scary stuff you along with your dog and posse of oshkosh bagosh wearing tough guys okay must use every means available to see that the world is returned to its normal state First, let's start with the good stuff. There we go. We can get some positivity. It's not all bad, guys. I'm sure they're going to say some good stuff about the game. Earthbound has a great... ...public transportation and the ability to use ATM machines... ATM machine? You mean ATMs. Uh, to spice up your wallet. Your dad is constantly putting money in your account, so when you are running low on cash, just call on Bank of America. Uh, I think there's better banks. Uh, another excellent aspect is the option to talk to everybody in the game. You're right, that is an excellent option. Normally in RPGs, you're not allowed to talk to people, but this one's a little different. Um, clues better talk to everyone, but don't fret if you miss something because no obstacle in this game is completely insurmountable. Also, you have a nerdy buddy who will call you on your cellular phone every so often and tell you that he's developed a new invention that you can use to light the, or sorry, to fight the enemy. I said light. How could, how could I have made that mistake? I mean, this page, like I said, it's very easy to read. When I zoom out like this, I mean, that text, it's so clear on this page right now. Anybody could read that. <laughs> uh, don't worry about having to... Uh, for all of its good features, Earthbound's infantile graphics made me want to gag. There we go. The characters look like the Flintstones kids. No, 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 Bobby's World. And the atmosphere of the game is nauseatingly cheery. Ah, oh, man, it sure is. <laughs> it sure is. Oh, nauseatingly. Uh, some cool weapons might have helped, but you won't find any that are worth using, that is, unless you think that... A gnarly way to pulverize a bad guy is to, is to whack him with a wiffle ball bat. Yeah, that's stupid. Why are you beating up bad guys with a baseball bat? Dumb. And that's really... In keeping with the overall visual cuteness, the only objects you can interact with are kids' toys. I don't think that's true. <laughs> I'm pretty sure you can interact with other objects in the game. Uh, not that it would come as a surprise, but the monsters in this game are laughable too. At one point, you, I, I, it's partially a comedy game. At one point, you actually get accosted by a disgruntled guitar and some pos possessed vinyl records. What? This sequence is surpassed in stupidity by... If you like cuteness, in fact, with a little violence and some more menacing weapons and creatures, this would have been an excellent RPG. 
Sadly, all Earthbound has to offer is a Barney-esque romp in McDonald's Playland. Je Jeff. Oh. Oh no, that's Jeff. That was Jeff from the previous page. Oh no. Oh no. <laughs> uh. By the way, this is the review they decided to go with. Is this one, the one that gave it a six? The graphics are goofy, but the plot and characters are memorable. No, it's crap. It's cutesy crap. Ugh, it makes me sick to my stomach. Ugh. Ogre battle. Now, this will like because it's not cutesy crap. Or maybe not, because it is also not a Western RPG. Well, they... They gave it a uh, much higher score. Well, there you go, everybody. If this game was any better, I'd go out and buy another Super Nintendo. Well, Tyrone, that's just confusing. Gabe says, a stunning RPG which takes many of its best features from classic war games. I loved it. And Chris B says, a thoughtful, detailed epic. Well, see, that's the secret, everybody. Don't make something cartoony, ever. Just don't. You're not allowed. Okay? You hear me? I'm being serious right now. Please take this very seriously. You need to take me seriously when I get angry about things like this. Okay? Okay. Now take me a bit seriously here. Enough. I've had enough. I don't need Barney the Dinosaur in all my video games. Thank you very much. Enough of this Mario crap. I've been saying it for years. Mario needs to be packing heat. Oh, I remember this game. I remember this game was pretty charming. Uh, it's very goofy. It's got goofy uh, cutscenes, goofy voice acting. Uh, I don't remember if it played well, but I remember it being amusing at least. I remember it being pretty entertaining. Oh, they got a lot of strategy going for uh, this game. If you're if you're stuck in that game, they got all the info for you. <laughs> Needs more space marines. Five years later, I I mean. If you guys are a little bit curious about why also gaming was in the direction it was in for a while, stuff like this was leading it there. At least people didn't tend to take these gaming magazines too seriously, but unfortunately, Earthbound? Yeah, this was not the only publication that gave it a negative review, specifically for the visuals. I remember countless magazines complaining about Earthbound, not because of gameplay, which that's the area I would understand. It's not a very, like, great battle system that you're starting off with, but it's fun by the end of the game, at least. Uh, there's stuff I like about it, too. I really like the... Uh, the health meter that rolls downwards and you can catch yourself from death. Uh, there's some neat stuff in there, but it's basic enough that I'm sure if people don't care for turn-based combat, it would make them upset. But everything else is kind of the whole point you play Earthbound. It's the charm of everything. It's the story. It's the characters. It's that art style. It's everything. The game even came with a strategy guide. And most... Uh, a lot of people saying it just looks like an NES game, 
a lot of people saying that it looks, it looks like Charlie Brown or they always compare it to some cartoon and then treat that like that's a bad thing, but then they review a Peanuts game like the next month and they give it a good review and then you're like, wait, what? So why is that okay? Why is this one bad? Oh, right, because when this one does it, it's cutesy crap? Uh, all right, if you say so. Hmm. It happened a lot, and once again, it stunk. It really stunk when good games just got... If people would have just been fine to acknowledge them as being solid titles, but man, people did not want to do that with most of these reviews. Uh, game magazine reviews could vary. Some publications, very few. Some could have okay enough reviews, but for the most part, stuff like that somebody having just a weird little personal like editorial where they're complaining about something like that the review starts with them saying like hey did you watch star trek last night me neither i am pissed about it i'm pissed i lost time out of my schedule because i had to play 12 hours i can't finish that feasibly so i didn't that's what reviews were like in a lot of game magazines. <laughs> what I just said there, now imagine that in text on a page, barely readable because the backdrop blends with the font. And then <laughs> they they sum up their review at the bottom by saying, graphics, I didn't like looking at them. Sound, I turned off my audio. I don't care what it sounded like. Replayability, I'm not playing it anytime soon. Overall, three out of 10. That's usually what reviews were like. Meaning, <laughs> it's really goofy to look back upon, but it does suck when you have those few moments of, fuck, that game was good, and that sucks that all these people collectively were shitting on it for really dumb reasons, and it ended up impacting the game. Uh, it's happened quite a few times, and I mean, the most obvious one I think everyone always turns to much later down the road, because that's when game reviews started to really matter. This era, they kind of mattered, not as much. Later on, they did start to matter, and the God Hand review that IGN did, I think... That even went towards sinking Clover, which is horrible because Clover was great. Clover made so many good games. They were so precious. They were so wonderful. And God Hand was a great game. It's a fantastic game. No. IGN decided to give it a 3 out of 10, and other critics were doing a good job following alongside that. Got panned pretty heavily, even though... There's nothing really wrong with that game. It's a pretty good game. I'm sorry, Clover. I'm sorry. Okami, beautiful job. I don't actually play the games that they're reviewing. But hey, win free stuff! That's what I'm talking about. Yes, you too can win some free stuff from the circle as many or as few as you like. When we video games archives, all you need to do to qual process the card will send your name and address Sify for our monthly drawing is to fill out below and drop circled those companies may add you to their mail it into a mailbox simple questions and there are knowing lists or simply send you more information on the wrong answers we'll even pick up the cost of products you're interested in postage in addition we'll draw five names from all the uh, sorry all of the uh the only thing we ask is this, while filling out the cards we receive each month and send each person card, pay attention to the grid of small numbers.
Note that. You never know what you might win. It all of the advertisements in the magazine have a could be a t-shirt, a poster, a free game, a pair of reader service card number at the bottom of the shoelaces, or even a rare promotional item, that one page. If you see an ad for a product or company of the game manufacturer sent to us, you can't win. You're interested in, find the RCS number on that ad. If you don't enter, so send in that reader service and circle the corresponding Wait, so this is like a thing about advertisers? Did you guys know that you had like a like a con artist constantly advertising through your magazine? They're actually a few pages back. Uh, they've been advertising in a lot of magazines. Did you notice that when they came back to you a few months later, they were under a new name? Oh, no, you didn't? Oh, weird. That's okay. Every other gaming magazine didn't seem to notice that either. <laughs> Ooh, I Ooh, sports wire, VR sports, the next generation. I love sports. But you know who else loves sports? I love sports. Everybody, it's me. I really like sports. Welcome to my game. They stretched me out just for it. This is are the ones that rated this one. Chris G says, "Great sound and FMV, but it's golf just the same." Uh, Chris B says, there's plenty of room in the Saturn software library for an innovative golf game. Unfortunately, this isn't going to distinguish the machine from the 3DO or any other high-end system. Yeah, you needed to have, like, guns in your golf game. To be fair, I, I also remember that most people just wanted sports games to be bland anyways. So I don't know what most of these reviews... Like NHL, like NHL game or something. It'd be the the newest FIFA. FIFA's later on. I'm gonna think of like really early stuff. I guess FIFA. FIFA, FIFA, FIFA I can't speak. FIFA did have games early on. I'm just trying to think what the what were core sports titles at the time. Madden Football was having its start, but Madden Football actually didn't get a lot of popularity until later. It was kind of up and down. I remember John Madden himself was apparently hard to work with too. I remember the early teams talked about it that he was really, really dissatisfied with how the games looked visually because he didn't understand the idea of But uh sports titles, usually the reviews were just in magazines anyways because hey, sports games, people wanted sports games. If people weren't into video games or they thought this was childish or they thought it was immature, which that was a mentality at the time. Video games, you were going to be looked down upon for playing. You're going to be like a weirdo for a while. I don't know why necessarily, because the first iteration of games in the West weren't really like that. Arcade Boom was pretty big and it was pretty real. People like playing Pac Man, they like playing games like that. Not sure why the second iteration of this was met with so much disdain like that. Well, at least Western gamers will like these because it's sports, and that's the thing that's going to get like the mainstream attracted to games. As long as we keep doing sports games, it's going to get the mainstream. And while it kind of did, also kind of didn't, industry is the biggest it's ever sort of been right now, and that wasn't coming exclusively off of sports games. Madden's existed, it's always had like great success, but very annoyingly, this is what they tried to do. Their way of hoping to get more people into video games was just bring up sports over and over again. 
and pray that eventually by making enough sports games, people will like video games. It uh, didn't work out too well. That's why we just had an overabundance of sports games for a while, and they all kind of blended together. And it was sort of hard to know if there was a good one mixed in with all of them because of that. And that's usually what the reviews would be. They'd always give them like a 7 or an 8, and they would just say, Yep, you can hit the ball. You can sport in this one. And it was just left at that. Even though they really wanted to push towards having a lot of sports sections in like these game magazines, or I think in Game Pro TV, it got moved to the sports network, so they had to keep talking about sports games with it. As much as they kept trying to push that kind of angle with it, they never had a lot to say. They had to keep talking about sports games, but they never had a lot to actually say about the sports games. All they could really say is just over and over again, yeah, it's got the, it's got players, it's uh, looking more uh, real, I guess. Uh, I don't know. You kick the ball? You never got a lot of discussion out of it, and that's why reviews like that. It's not that surprising. They can't say much outside of just like, I don't know, it's golf. Well, if you like Super Black Bass, you're gonna love this. I'll take their word. Head-on soccer. Well done, but hardcore soccer fans will probably still go for FIFA. Yeah, see, FIFA was pretty far back. Uh... By the way, this got an 8, so yeah, move over Earthbound. This game's better. Also, move over Mega Man 7. This game's better. Slam Jam, where you can play as, uh, whatever that is, guy with basketball for a head. <laughs> also better than Earthbound. I like the screenshot. This, uh... <laughs> This man is slapping over the head of a literal giant. Triple play baseball. Oh, it gets a seven. It, it's baseball. What can you say? It, it's baseball. Great animation. I like it when the players spit. Ooh, that gets it an eight. Great attention to detail, but the screen scrolling is too choppy. Ooh. Gonna have to take a point off for that one. Uh, graphics, it's a six. Sound, a six. So that means overall seven. Do not question our scoring system. You have to understand it is already kind of arbitrary to assign a number to a game. But anyways, we're gonna do it. Look at this really tall guy. <laughs> <laughs> they really like stretching out this artwork vertically. I don't know why they keep doing it. The batters look great. Uh, <laughs> the commentator miscalled plays a lot. Uh-oh. But at least there's a clipboard with a, a bun bunch of checks on it. Uh, it does not have password backup. Nor does it have instant replay. Uh, and it doesn't even have five player support. Come on. I may as well just go play my turbo graphics now. This one is fair. This is a rare exception case because unlike all these other sports games, this one does stand out. And for whatever reason too, this was fine for people. This was a rare time where people went, yes, you can do this. Oh, is it wacky? Is it kind of cartoony? Yeah, but you're allowed to do this because it's over the top and it's fun. Uh, NBA Jam is legitimately a fun game. It is a very fun game. I don't like a lot of sports games, obviously, but when they're done well, they can be done well, and NBA Jam is incredibly fun. You can play it over and over and over again. I played it constantly as a kid. Uh... I even remember in high school, for whatever reason, our school had a cabinet of it and they pulled it out for like school dances. And I remember it was end of the year, uh, everyone was gonna be graduating 
nobody was dancing. Everybody just went over and it was playing NBA Jam and just having fun because uh, it was a four-player cabinet and everyone was just switching off. Uh, game that most people could even get into and play. Controls are simple. It's straightforward enough. Uh, a lot of stuff in there. Just a good time. Why did a school have an NBA Jam cabinet? I have no idea. I really don't know. I remember for most of the year it was just locked away in like a closet, like in storage with a bunch of other things, but they would pull it out for dances, they would pull it out for stuff, and anytime they did, everybody was always flocking over to it, so I guess they had it for a reason. It was a very, very, very popular game. Uh, to be fair though, might have also been like exceptionally popular where I was living because Midway Games was also stationed in Chicago, and also Chicago Bulls were on a hot streak and really big at the time, so uh, basketball is incredibly big in uh, Chicago. I guess makes enough sense that everybody was playing it like crazy at the time. Uh, but still, in general, people really like NBA Jam, and yeah, it's a good game. It's a very good game. Yes, it's true. Chicago is a very big basketball city. I, enough so that I think I've told this story before. When Michael Jordan was quitting, <laughs> we we all got told to leave class and we all gathered in the auditorium and they wheeled out a little TV screen and it was him giving a speech and everyone was allowed to go home afterwards. Uh... Obviously, nothing like that ever happened again, but I do remember that, too. That's a very distinct memory I have. <laughs> that was such a big deal uh, when that happened. No, it's true. Free day off. I can't complain. The bowls were really big. Uh, I've talked about this one too, Scotty Pippen. Uh, Michael Jordan is not in NBA Jam. It's not a surprise. But getting like a license for that. He might have even licensed himself to something else at the time. Although I'm not sure. I would have to read into that. If he like, I think there is there there is a, a Michael Jordan basketball game that he was in. Uh, might be a couple he was in, I don't know, but they didn't seem to want to bother with it, getting him in there. Uh, I know Shaquille O'Neal, I think, was another one they were trying to avoid licensing on, and I think they were going to license him. It was kind of up and down with that. There are a few players that they were sort of up and down with that stuff uh, that sometimes they might have appeared in games, sometimes they wouldn't. And Michael Jordan, what's weird to me with him not being in NBA Jam is just, it, it's fair, he got huge massive uh became a really popular probably one of the most valuable just basketball players of all time uh, just period but he was fine to do you know what what am i talking about he did have his own game he had michael jordan like chaos in the windy city which was a 2d platformer where you played as michael jordan and he threw basketballs at basketball robots and he had to save all the Chicago Bulls from an evil scientist. Uh, how did I forget about that game? That was a thing. But yeah, he did stuff like that. Stuff like that was okay. He, he could <laughs> he could put his name on stuff like that. He did a... Uh, was it Pro Stars was the cartoon? There was a cartoon that it's... Uh, who was it? Wayne Gretzky, Michael Jordan... trying to remember because I want to get the name of it right too the cartoon okay it was it was pro stars it was Wayne Gretzky Michael Jordan Bo Jackson there's the three of them that they're I can't really call them a superhero team it's not like they have supernatural abilities it's just it's them they're a group of three people solving crimes uh and they had live action bits mixed in too where they would like answer questions from like fans but 
He's fine to do stuff like that. Michael Jordan was fine to put himself in like everything everywhere. So it was a little bit sad that NBA Jam they didn't get him. But they had Scottie Pippen, and that was the thing I could remember was that Scottie Pippen, because he was on the Bulls and he was also a good player at the time, uh, he took a lot of tie-ins too, and there was a specific endorsement. I brought this one up in the past. Lost Media. Uh, if anyone ever finds it, you will be the first one to have finally found it. Uh, he had a drink called Zippin, and I, I think it was just like apple juice. It wasn't even anything special, it was just generic fruit juice, but... They kept running ads just saying Zippin' Pippin over and over again because it was a big deal that Scotty Pippin has a drink. Uh, they ran it for like a year. I remember getting it. I remember actually drinking it. I remember getting it a couple of times. It wasn't anything special, but it existed. It was a thing. The Bulls were big. Basketball was very big in Chicago. But yeah, licensing for Michael Jordan has always been up and down. At the very beginning, obviously, he wasn't as valuable. And then once he was becoming a big name, he became so valuable that, yeah, you were not going to license him. It just wasn't going to happen. But that's the thing with NBA Jam. It was when he was becoming, like, a figure. Uh, but he also had titles where he was getting his license a head scratcher as to why NBA Jam didn't go for it but others kind of did but to be fair Midway has also been up and down too they kind of had like big successes as well as massive failures and usually with Midway their biggest issue was their arcade games were doing well for them home console was kind of a tough area for Midway and at least NBA Jam Acclaim did solid ports of those games those did make Midway a lot of money. Uh, I could even just understand the licensing was just going to be way too unreal. We've got some controversy with the NBA. Uh, sorry, NBA. I was going to say NBAA. Association, association. Uh, but they did have some controversy with the NBA. Tournament edition of NBA Jam was going to sneak in the Mortal Kombat characters, the secret characters you could play as. And they even wanted to have like a special place that they could play in. Uh, they were going to make a special, like, court. But that's what happened was the NBA found out about it, and they were not happy about that because they didn't want to be associated with such a controversial franchise. Uh, so later revisions stripped out the Mortal Kombat characters. You can go look it up. You uh, as well as a couple of other characters that got taken out. Like, there's a Grim Reaper uh, you could play as. It's just a Halloween costume. There were a lot of secret characters in NBA Jam. Uh, a lot of team mascots were in there. Benny the Bull was playable, I remember. Uh, Bill Clinton was playable. Uh, <laughs> I think George Clinton was playable, wasn't he? They had a lot of crazy playable characters in there. A lot of crazy secrets. Oh, you haven't played NBA Jam Tournament Edition on 32X and Game Boy. You're right, I haven't. <laughs> uh, I, I've played it in the arcade. I've played it on Super Nintendo. I played it on uh, Sega Saturn. The Sega Saturn version is pretty weird. It's not quite the same game. It's a little bit different than the arcade version. I would have hoped. I would have hoped for like an accurate port or something, like one for one. It's a little bit different. They also wanted to show off. They always want to do like arranged music if it's a CD game. And some of it's actually not bad. But the actual in. The in game music, I think in the Genesis version. The Super Nintendo version, I think, silences the in game music from what I recall. Uh, but. Best part of NBA Jam history altogether here. Uh, NBA Jam Triple X, if no one's ever heard of that. Look that one up for sure. Uh, the announcer for NBA Jam, uh, he's very iconic. They were goofing around when they were making NBA Jam, and there were some clips that got used for a special version of the game called NBA Jam Triple X. It was kind of a joke version. 
and a lot of voice clips getting swapped out for lines like he's on fucking fire grabs his johnson uh get that shit out of here lots of just excessive cursing everywhere and it's a lot of fun it's really funny to play the game that way in fact i really like some of those voice clips even <laughs> i prefer some of those to the actual nba jam clips get that shit out of here is always really funny to hear <laughs> whenever you block somebody's shot or somebody ends up fucking up really bad that too if you're about to he if you're heating up single voice clip got swapped and it's really goofy it's really entertaining uh he denied that that was him and they tried to deny that that was even a real version of the game but people have broken it apart they've looked it through like the code and everything too it doesn't seem faked it seems 100 percent real because what an elaborate fake that would have to be no, it seems to be the real deal. It just seems like a thing they don't want to really acknowledge. Maybe they they're felt ashamed? I don't know. But it's fun. It's really entertaining. The original. Go download Triple X. There you go. That's the best version. Play that one. <laughs> or play Tournament Edition because they have more content in there. Uh, but we're at the end of the magazine. Well, guys. I guess we're done here with video games. Let's remember all the good times we had. Video games. The Ultimate Gaming Magazine. Reviews that rock! Would you guys say those reviews rocked? I would say those reviews rocked. Uh, they put Earthbound on there, on that list of reviews that rock, and man, that review really rocked. What a review. <laughs> Imagine if Mario 64 looked like that. But, uh, yeah, that was video games. Uh, I learned a lot today. I learned a lot about video games. I learned that Sony waking, waking in their boots right now. They are terrified about that Sega Saturn. At E3, I, I bet that Sony's even going to pull out. I bet that they're going to just give up. I think they're calling it quits. I learned that games made in Japan are just inherently worse than any sports title made in the West. Um, I learned that Earthbound just looks like Bobby's World when you really think about it. And Bobby's world, it just looks like Earthbound. Howie Mandel was actually inspired by the Mother series. He said that his original stand-up material was even partially inspired. I think you could call Earthbound a Bobby like. I think that's fair. I think we could we could refer to it that way. I like that in the review they have to make like three different comparisons to what it looks like and then none of them have a similar art style whatsoever. I think the point they were trying to make is that they were all cartoons that have kids in them. And that's a problem. Uh, now hockey or hockey, I don't know if it's hockey or hokey, uh, was it, was it his own? Was it like, 
a screenshot from a Bobby's World episode? Why why would he do that? Was it Uncle Ted? It's funny because Bobby's World was relevant back at the time. toys for it. I remember they had cassette tape releases for the songs in it, so if you want to listen to Howie Mandel singing singing songs on that voice. <laughs> uh, it ran for a while. It was going to have a Super Nintendo game. The prototype is out there. It never got released, but it had a stay. It was there for a while. Uh, I think it's just because it was also Fox Kids anyways, so most people had access to it. You didn't need to have cable. Most people could just watch it. Just got bored. Uh, then last year we tried rewatching it again, and I think we fell asleep watching it. Uh, and then we did at least watch the Christmas special last year where Bobby accidentally sets the... Does he set the Christmas tree on fire? I feel like he does. Somebody sets the Christmas tree on fire. But just before it cuts to the commercial break, it's a close-up of Bobby's face of him screaming in horror looking at the Christmas tree on fire. And his eyes turn into the Christmas tree on that it cuts to the commercial break uh, in the Christmas special. Uh, at least there's that. At least Bobby's World had, like, one okay joke. I don't know if that was meant to be a joke, but I liked it. It was funny. Where am I? They did that a lot. I remember I had, like, I think it was a cousin that they brought that up. There was an episode of Bobby's World where they're going to a swimming pool and he's nervous about going through a revolving gate because he thinks it's going to jumble up like all of his body parts. And I remember Rugrats did that a lot too. At least with Rugrats, they were all ones that kind of made sense. It's things that kids already would have brought up like a monster under the bed or going down the, the drain. Bobby's World, it was just weird stuff that nobody was ever going to think about or ever think of. And it was just showing up and going, no, 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 think about this, though. Really think about this, kids. J were you not fearful of going through a revolving door? Don't worry. Howie Mandel's here to confuse you. <laughs> because Howie Mandel was frightened by a lot of things when he was younger, I guess. The thing is, Life with Louie, I'm not even kidding. We watched some of it last year. Some episodes, yes, they were very boring, but they were significantly better than Bobby's World. There were a couple of episodes that I'm not going to say they were great. They were not. I'm not going to even go as far as maybe saying, like, good necessarily, but they were fine. Uh, they actually weren't bad to watch. Because Louis Anderson has a funny voice. Uh, but yeah, I was surprised by that. If anything, I thought Life with Louis was going to be, like, if anything, worse than Bobby's World. But no, it was the other way around. Bobby's World was really, really boring to go back to and kind of unwatchable, even, in some cases. Uh, I would probably just fall asleep. If somebody put on a marathon of Bobby's World, I think I would fall asleep after two episodes. Life with Louie, there's episodes that are entertaining. There's stuff in there that can be funny on occasion. It's not common. It can also fall flat completely like... It wasn't horrible. It was fine. Yeah.
Yeah, Louis Anderson did die fairly recent, and it was actually sad. We had just watched the Life with Louis Christmas special last year. We were actually watching it uh, a couple of times. So when that came out, that was actually a few days after we had just watched it. And it was a bummer to hear because it was a thing of like, oh no, just as we were starting I feel bad for him, too. I do remember about that whole blackmail situation when he was younger as well. Uh, what happened with him, like, during the 90s, and it was completely, like, unfair to his part. Like, it sounded like a complete disaster at the time. I guess, to be fair, I remember back to all the stories about it when I was younger. I guess I should read into the full extent of it. But it was a pretty fucked up thing that had happened. I know it's a thing that even made him fearful in terms of, like, what he was going to do with himself and career and everything. Uh, it sounds like he had a really rough time. Uh, but now that we're done reading Game Magazine, uh, I'll be reading some donations here. And we will be wrapping up stream. Uh, why? Well, I, I might do another one of these, uh, like next week or something. I guess we'll see. Uh, I do have a lot of stuff I need to juggle. I teased at something I got kind of thrown into my lap pretty recently. It was sort of out of nowhere, but I don't mind it. I think you guys will be happy with it. We did fall behind a bit because of all the health problems lately. Um, Julian did get called, I think, just a few days ago. He did get called about his second dental appointment that's coming up. So he's going to be getting his uh, tooth taken care of. They're going to be giving him his uh, like final mold that they're putting over his tooth, or whatever you want to call it. Uh, crown. Me brain no work. Uh, reading those reviews, we oof, really melted. Unexpected one for my end. I thought I was doing fine, and then on the fourth, when I woke up that morning, my head was spinning like crazy. I thought I actually fell off my bed. I thought I was on the floor. I wasn't. I was just everything was spinning that hard that I couldn't keep track of anything I couldn't stand up I could barely even move at all and I was just in the bathroom for like the entire day just sick to my stomach I'm not exaggerating with that I think I was in there for like five hours straight I, I just couldn't move or anything I was constantly spinning the problem was I tried doing the exercises. We tried a few of them even. We looked into a bunch of them. We took a lot of the advice of people. It made it worse. Each time I tried any of it, it made it worse. And anything that said that, oh, the dizziness will pass in like 30 seconds to about a minute, it didn't pass. In fact, it got so much worse that at one point I was just spinning for like, God, it felt like a half hour. It probably wasn't a half hour, but it felt so endless that, once again, like, I was just... It... ...completely still, because if I moved even slightly, I would start spinning again. And it wasn't mild. It was not a slight, like, effect happening here. It was bad enough that if it started, it would pick up speed and it would get more and more intense the longer it was happening. So I had just had to just ensure I wasn't moving whatsoever. And I had to try to focus my vision on something in the room to just make sure I wouldn't keep spinning. Uh, Julian helped out a lot. He really didn't need to even. I, I'm, I'm thankful he was. I, it was scary. 
I haven't had anything like this ever happen before. And I would expect it's because of the stuff that was going wrong with my ears the past few years here. Uh, I already was getting kind of dizzy last year because of my ears. I don't... I, I don't know. At least things are getting a little bit better here. I'm still dizzy. I'm having to sit a certain way here just so I don't, like, get too dizzy. It's getting better at least. I was also just sweating profusely for, like, the first three or four days. Here. We didn't go to a doctor because we don't, you know, want to spend money on that kind of thing. And at least it is getting a bit better. I've also been taking, I haven't been taking it anymore, but I was taking some uh, Dramamine during all of it, and it was helping. Uh, so it's getting better. I'm able to at least do some stuff now. I can talk, I can work. Uh, it's still kind of there. I still can feel myself, like, getting dizzy on occasion. But I'm trying to still, like, just sit in a very, uh, specific position. It's, like, starting to go away. But the start of this week, it was, like, nightmarish. I I've never really felt anything like that before in my life. And I think I described it on stream when it was, like going in and out at the time it was worse than even some of the most painful experiences i think i've had in my life because i i've had crazy stuff happen i've had my head split open uh when we're back in la we almost weren't able to move because my toe completely snapped in half onto its side and I had to snap it back into place and we had to go get it looked at uh, I'm I, I've had some pretty crazy situations and this even felt worse than that because like I said when I was spinning it didn't slow down eventually or anything it was continuously picking up speed uh, you know how games like FPS's they have the option for acceleration for turning so if you hold the joystick to the right, for example, in like a console shooter, you slowly start rotating. Continuously picking up speed until eventually just everything was a blur and I'd have to close my eyes or otherwise I would just have to lose everything in my stomach. It was awful. Uh, I hope it never happens again. It was really, really, really bad. Uh, and at least it's passing. Uh, apologies for that, though, because I did want to have the summer resort stuff done this week. Uh, it's a little unfortunate getting so many things thrown in to just impact scale. Uh, I have worked on it a little bit this weekend. I'm probably actually going to lay down after this stream because I will say I'm still feeling a little bit dizzy. I probably do want to lay down for a bit. Um, thank you to everybody who has been helping out the past couple of months here as well. I know spirits have been kind of low here. Uh, we've been pretty fearful about where things are going to be going, but... After all of this and after talking to Julian and even after hearing from so many people the past week here, I think I'm starting what I'd like to prioritize and that's just kind of having fun. I want to make stuff and just do stuff and it's always what I've wanted to prioritize. We've always had things getting in the way, sure, but... I think it's just important for people to be making things anyways. If you have the ability to make something, it's probably important that you should be making things. Even if not many people are going to see it, even if it's only going to be a handful of people seeing it or something, I think it's just important for people to make things and put things out there. I feel like people have built up a lot of fear on doing that sort of thing, and because of that, options have been a lot more limited too. Something I really like
online when you were younger like if people were younger i guess i should say if you were growing up like early days of the internet you'd probably say that with excitement you go hey what's going on online what's going on online today you wouldn't say the first one i fumbled my words but yeah you'd probably eagerly say hey what's going on on the internet today now it's more so oh boy what's going on today it's not quite the same and if less small scale people are going to be making and posting stuff we're just gonna Again, if people have the ability to make something, you should be making things. People should be doing things. Uh, I I know that like the past decade was a big one for people being fearful about cringe, but ultimately all I took from that was, okay, so the cringe stuff is significantly more interesting than anything else that's going to be offered as an alternative. People just getting angry and insecure about everything is way less interesting than people just being themselves and being weird. I'd much rather have that. I'd like to just see all sorts of different perspectives and all sorts of different ideas. And I don't know, I, I, I guess I've been feeling more motivated just through a lot of that. I'd like to still make things. I still want to keep posting stuff because some of this stuff too, I wouldn't necessarily want it to go away. This game magazine stuff, for example. I don't think a lot of people know stuff about old game magazines. I don't think people remember even some of the specific game history back at the time. You had to sort of be there. Uh, earlier, I was talking to Zone about an old arcade machine I had seen. And I found it. Uh, while I did find it, there is no gameplay footage of it. ROM never got dumped. It. and there was a promotional flyer and there is a review for it that exists too saying the game was horrible uh but i remember that game when i was younger and that's the thing that's a memory of mine i ran into it it seems like it was insanely unpopular as a game so probably barely anyone ever ran into that game and now that it doesn't exist anywhere you can't play it it hasn't been dumped there's barely any information on it that could be something that just eventually fizzles away like it never even happened. And that's why it's even important for that too. If you had experiences like that, hopefully people can still like keep that going. And while that can work for content, what about experiences that you weren't really there for? People misrepresent that sometimes. What things were actually like back at the time as opposed to what you sort of read some details about. And on something like that, if nobody was even there for it, only a couple of people really have a memory of it, it's almost like it didn't even happen. I'm glad more people have been posting lost media and everything too. It's important for these things to carry on. I'm surprised some of this stuff even ended up lost. Some of these eras, you don't think that stuff should have ended up lost, and yet they can. On YouTube? Because I wanted to watch a really specific one I wanted to find. I used to watch it way back. And I couldn't find it anymore because VHS rip, that's not what you get when you search for that on YouTube. You don't get actual VHS rips. What you get is Graggle Simpson. What you get is uh, every copy of Mario 64 is uh, personalized. You get stuff like that. You get fake anti-piracy screens. You just get things that people made hoping to get views because they're memes. But then if you want the real stuff, you also important to keep putting things out there it's important to keep doing things because you don't want stuff to disappear either or just get overwritten uh 
it's a really weird place online right now, and it's why I guess I was partially feeling so de demotivated. Not just because everything's been so rough here, but because, yeah, I don't know. It's not the thing I grew up with, and that's also a sign of just getting older, I guess. But it feels like a lot of excitement is left online. And while I'm probably not someone good for providing that, I'm monotone, I'm boring, I'd at least like to try putting So I've been feeling better about stuff. I've been I've been feeling a little bit better about things. Things are still scary. Things are still rough here. But we're gonna be trying the best that we can and doing the best that we can. That's what we've always been doing. Greggle Simpson is really weird to me because I feel like that joke was already done with the Simpsons before of people trying to do that. It's not even very believable. The drawing itself, he's given... There was a recent episode, I don't know what season it was because I don't keep up with it, but they did that as a joke in it. That they pretended there was a character that has always existed in the show that had just been killed off, and they showed like clips from a bunch of episodes he was already in. They've already done that themselves as a gag. Raggle Simpson is a very like uninteresting continuation of that sort of thing. It feels like it's sort of awkwardly copycatting a bunch of other attempts at, like, fake lost media stuff like that. Uh, if people are still, like, entertained... ...community was actually really pissed off about it, like, a couple of years back, especially after the Giga Leak. They were trying to find a lot of new stuff with Mario 64, and they were. They are making big breakthroughs, but at the same time, that's when analog horror became popular, and that's when a lot of little kids were uploading the spooky Mario 64 videos. And thanks to that happening, tons of misinformation spreading, as well as people just getting weird about it. People were thinking the Bowser room was real. There were some videos legitimately trying to report on that in, like, a scary, serious voice. That's basically what all of this is. We're just seeing a repeat of it. <laughs> but at least back then at the time, while it did exist, it was ridiculous enough that people knew not to believe most of it. This stuff is a little bit frustrating too because people do get misled by it and then they insist on it even further and then conversation gets muddied even more and if you're trying to look for the actual thing you're trying to look for, good luck. You really have to dig now. You really have to dig if you're trying to look for something. It's really tough right now for that. Simpson, oh boy. I mean, they would. I've been expecting them to just do Dead Bart already as a Halloween special. But maybe just in general, too, it'd be kind of nice if just content was getting uploaded elsewhere, I don't know. Everyone still does want to rely on YouTube for the most part for that, but that's also why things are utilized through algorithms the way that they are. Maybe you could have more likely a chance of finding the thing you were looking for. Google really prioritizes stuff now based on advertisers as well. It's very hard to find the stuff you're looking for online. It's become a challenge, and it's too bad for that. That's why, once again, I'm saying the thing of, if anyone has the power to create right now or do stuff, you should be doing it because things are getting kind of bleak, and 
at least everyone does have the ability to potentially like turn that around if they want to. People can still. I mean, imagine if you're an independent, it's even harder. It's not like it's easy right now to ask people to keep making things, obviously. Most people are struggling at the moment. But it is important. It's becoming just such a miserable place when you can't have, you know, more cool, fun, exciting things out there. But I'm hoping, and I do feel like there will be more in the future at least. I think it's just a rough time for people, obviously. That's why things have taken a bit of a hit. But on my own end, I want to still be making things and doing things. I think it is a good thing for people to be making things and trying new stuff out. And hell, it gives you a bit of perspective too. If you've ever been someone who's wondering how, like, a video game works, look into making a game. You might start understanding it, and you can even maybe formulate some discussions around it. You might start picking up on things you never knew before. It's always worth learning about a thing, uh, a thing that you're interested in, get into a subject a little bit more. I know some people might treat it like it's a bad thing to, like, know too much about a subject, but no, I feel like if it's something you're interested in, yeah, go for it. Okay, there it is. Sorry. <laughs> Did you hear about all the new games? took a big hit uh influencer culture became a thing so once people understood that they could just watch someone who actually plays games and is showing you the footage of the games as opposed to going to people who are paid to play a game for about three hours and then are given strict guidelines on what they can and can't talk about yeah i think it's pretty obvious where people are going to turn they're not going to go for the game reviewers anymore they're going to go for people who are actually playing the games and showing them Maybe doing a video that actually goes for like an hour and a half talking about the game. Uh, unfortunately, that... ...happened. Game studios became wise, they know that now. Okay, well, game reviewers aren't being trusted. Who's being trusted? YouTubers, okay. So reach out to the YouTubers, give them early copies, have them sign stuff. They're new to all of this, they're unfamiliar to a lot of this. A lot of them are young, they're not too wise to this yet, so they'll probably sign on for deals like this. We can get them to do the same things, and yeah, it's worked. It actually has been very successful in some cases. If you're wondering why you used to hear more about indie games earlier on YouTube, and now you don't really hear about them, that's partially why. There was more of an opened up scene to that. I would also say But it does also make legitimate gaming content a little bit harder to find in some cases. Things have changed a lot online over the past five years. <laughs> it's been a weird process. It's been a very weird process. But that's why I'm saying I think it's still important for people to be making and doing things. Because if you're feeling like something is lacking or there's something that you really would like to see, well, if no one else is doing it, and you have the ability to make things, fair enough then, I, you can give it a shot. 
you could be the one to do it then. On, but that's why I feel partially motivated. Not like I feel like I have to do it. It's more so it's the stuff that I like, so of course I'd like to do it. I want to keep doing stuff that I care about. I want to keep making things that I care about. Uh, CRT Frank. It was the... Chris specifically got a copy of it early because I don't even remember what the whole situation was. Because it wasn't through a contracted deal, so there were no expectations with it. But, uh,. Prior to that, I remember there were a few offers to take sponsorship deals with like specific arrangements and agreements being presented, and they were just never taken because, yeah, if you have to do that, what's the point? I think people remember back, a great example of it was Dunkey. Dunkey did that video for Microsoft, it was that Brothers game or whatever, that they gave him a copy, they told him just do your thing, so he did, and he made fun of it, and then they said, nope, you breached contract. They have a bounty board, which is just sponsorship deals. They have a board listing of sponsorship deals that you can take, and it's things like, play this game on stream for an hour and a half, and if you have this many viewers in your stream, uh, then you will be paid this much money at the end of your stream. They have a bunch of those listed. I've never done them, I've never want to, uh, but that is a thing that exists too. So... If you ever watch a streamer and you hear them recommend a game that doesn't seem in character for them, and then you watch another streamer and, weird, they're playing the same thing, and they're actually making mention of sp movie and make mention of how you like the... the the lore behind the character. That was a thing that they worked into it. Uh, stuff like that could be bounty board stuff. You do, I think, now at least have to make mention that you took it, but initially when they introduced it, you didn't have to say a thing. You didn't have to let anybody know that you were taking a sponsorship. Uh, 